Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength. That I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Psalms 131 verses 1. Psalm 31 verses 1. The Bible says, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in matters too great or in things too wonderful. Somebody shout hallelujah. When the psalmist says that his heart is not haughty or his eyes are not lofty and because of that he does not exercise himself in matters too great or in things too wonderful for him. It does not mean that it is wrong to exercise yourself in a thing, but he's telling us that there's a problem if you exercise yourself in a thing higher than you are. Somebody shout hallelujah. And because we're not supposed to exercise ourselves in things or matters too great, or too wonderful, or too hard to ponder for us, it does not mean that those things by God are forever supposed to be denied from us. This is an expression of a temporal experience of our human existence where sometimes at the life and stage we are on, in our places of maturity, and understanding certain things are too great for us that it is wisdom in the little we have not to exercise ourselves in matters too great for us or things so wonderful for us. I'll give you a typical example. When we were younger, okay, we used to have conversations. And then sometimes all people would sit, my father, his friends, or my mom and our friends, and then they would have conversation, right? But if you're a child, there are conversations that you're not supposed to be involved in. Do I have a witness? And I remember when we were little, sometimes when you start conversations, my mom or dad would tell you, this is not for your age. You remember that? And that means by reason of where your brain is and your understanding and your experiences in the maturation of life. You have not designed enough, you have not come to the maturity of judgment enough to give an opinion, not because we don't value your opinion, but it is because even in its own value, these matters are higher than you. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so, we were barred from having certain conversations with adults, and yet, there were conversations that we enjoyed as a family. Like all of us do, we had conversations. I played with my mom, I played with my dad, and we had a very wonderful time when we were growing up. But there were times certain conversations were not for us, even though they were spoken in our presence. Does somebody connect to what I'm saying? But as we grow older, some of the same conversations our fathers and mothers even used to now begin with us. They say, you know what, I want to have a conversation with you. And then you meet them and they start a narration of things back in the day you were not able to articulate. And now they can engage and open a conversation with you because now they know that you're mature by reason of exercise and use by maturation and judgment to speak. And so they now ask us of the questions and have conversations with us that they could not have with us when we were children. It was wrong for us to exercise ourselves in matters that were beyond us. And even as parents, when you're raising your children, you raise them with the wisdom to know when their opinions are 
welcome and when their opinions are not welcome. Because in there also is a wisdom for your child to know where they end and where they must not go beyond the boundaries of the conversations that they have with you. That mean you don't love them, that mean you don't value their opinions. It only means that certain stuff is not for children. And why do we think that this happens in the physical sense of human beings, but it doesn't happen also in our spaces of our life as Christians? Because when you become born again, you're not automatically mature. You can assume that you're mature. You can have things around you that can deceive you that you are mature. Because some people, when the gifting of God comes on their life, some of them think, I think I'm mature enough to exercise myself in matters of this magnitude of things uh, to ponder of this degree. But it is wisdom even to know who you are in God, where exactly you are in God, not to assume yourself, okay? Paul always says in the scriptures that we don't exercise ourselves beyond measure, okay? We don't move ourselves beyond measure. We don't speak beyond measure. He says we don't exalt ourselves beyond measure. In other words, we always keep the constant assurance and reminder for us to minister, speak, and deal where we are in God. It is respect to know that I'm not here, I can't exercise myself here, but with faithfulness and my commitment toward God as I increase in knowledge, wisdom, and revelation, there are spaces I will be allowed, there are spaces God will grant me to be able to have a voice in this kind of place. Are you hearing me? Why? Because if you don't carry that wisdom, you sometimes expose yourself in spaces of judgment where you need not to be judged. Somebody shout hallelujah. In places of judgment where you need not to be judged. For example, Aaron and Miriam were not in the space of judging Moses. It doesn't mean that Moses was right. It only means they were not in the level and rank to judge Moses. But because they could hear God, and Miriam insists, so do we not hear God? Have he not spoken to us too? And what does the scripture tell us? The scripture tells us God strikes her with leprosy. And Aaron could have died if it was not a high priest. But people never know to follow the life of Aaron. But even when we don't see judgment on him as a priest, his preservation was not his rank. It was the garment that he wore. It wasn't his understanding. Understanding was not the preserver of Aaron. It was his garment. And the Bible says the moment Moses removed that garment, the man fell dead. He didn't need to be sick. And sometimes we ask ourselves whether we find places of life and function either in the garments that we wear, the anointing that we wear, or the maturity and heart that we have toward God. Because like I always say, that also has its own anointing. Somebody shout hallelujah. And God requires us to have a certain experience of maturity and wisdom even beyond the garments that we wear. Because those garments are for a time. Are you hearing me? But when we get to the spaces of writing history and posterity, as believers, certain things you ponder deeply. And as you grow in God, there are certain conversations you will not have, not because you don't have an opinion, but because that's not you. Praise God. But that doesn't mean that God wants you to stay there. God wants all of us to mature. God wants all of us to what? to grow, that we'll be able to judge, because the Bible says he has given the church the opportunity to judge the world and to judge the saints as well. So even though we shouldn't, but God is working to mature us to places where we are able to judge certain matters. If you understand it, shout amen. But also in this understanding, I provoke you to think more deeply on why certain people stay in lower 
graces and inferior ranks for a very long time, even with what God has given them and the abilities that God has placed them. Sometimes we ask ourselves the questions, how do we function in more and more elevated graces and superior ranks of the Spirit? Because if as a Christian you don't have that in you, then you are dead even without knowing from the root. Because the Christ that supplied this root of Jesse, the vine from which we are the branch, he intends that we are from one level of glory to another level of glory. From faith to faith, from knowledge to knowledge. Somebody shout hallelujah. And because of that then, certain things are translated as you mature and the wisdom of God is established on your life. You're elevated in higher graces. And these graces define how much favor is on your life. And how many people really catch your eye and the kind of ranks that catch your eye. Okay? Or whose eye you catch. Because some of you, you're just a minute away from somebody's eye. They just look at you once and your life will never be the same again. You understand what I'm saying? Some of you, somebody just needs to give you attention for five seconds and your life will never be the same again. Because certain people are the sources of our blessings. God says men shall give to your bosom. So don't think that God will use anything except men. Even when he's working in our lives, he uses men. Ordinary people like the people you're seated next to. Somebody shout hallelujah. But then I fear, because we don't have this wisdom and we've not taught men how to grow in these things, we see that there are continuous errors in the body of Christ and some men exercise themselves in sacred things without sacred anointings. You understand? And when you don't have the anointing of a thing you're exercising yourself into, that is the worst calamity <laughs> that any believer should have. Everybody should be able to function in the thing God has called you in the anointing God has ordained you. Are you hearing me? Because the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, the one he gave you and I, which is the seal, the guarantee of, of things to come, the promise that we received, fulfills a bigger purpose in our lives more than just the usual things people call miracles. Because the Bible says in Hebrews, he says, and all of these having obtained the promises, the Bible says they did not receive the promise. For God having something better for us, that their testimony would not be made perfect without us. Think about the place of the Holy Spirit, where what is happening on your life will complete Elijah's testimony. Where what is happening on your life will complete Moses' testimony. Where what is happening on your life will complete all the men and great women of God, the cloud of witnesses that, you know, are watching this wonderful course that each one of us is walking in Christ. And to think for a moment that every man and woman in this room has grace to walk in that, to access that, to reveal and be revealed in that. It is so far a thing to understand and fathom when you think about it. God is no respecter of persons. Somebody shout hallelujah. God can use anybody and he will use anybody. I have told people, many of us, it's because we do not know how to yield ourselves to God and how to apply ourselves and our hearts to avail ourselves to God to use us the way he should. But God wants to use everybody mightily. The earth will never be enough for what he's able to do through us. Somebody said, hallelujah. The world will never be enough. The Bible says, if you go to the things Jesus did, if they were to be written, the volume of the books were to be brought together, John says, even the earth would not contain them. But what we read are just gospels and letters of the things Christ did. And sometimes just to sit in communion with the spirit of John to understand the things he saw, that books could not write. When you understand those things, I wonder how you can look for a sermon. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? Because John tells you clearly, he says that if the things that were done of the Christ were to be written, he says, if you get this volume of books and just write the things Christ did, the things he taught, he says, if you were to put them in books, the earth would not contain them. That means every man writing in the Gospels and the letters is simply giving us their eye in the matter. Somebody shout hallelujah. That is why Paul always uses the word that you might understand my knowledge in the mystery. He says my knowledge. He says if any man preach any other gospel except this gospel. In fact, in one account he calls it my gospel. Why is Paul calling it my gospel? He's trying to tell us that there is a place, there is a space in God where you can only give what you have seen. As far as you have gone in God, that is not all of God. That is only what you have seen in God. Somebody shout hallelujah. But to even imagine that John would dare to make such a statement and say that these things that Jesus did, if they were to be written, what were those things, John? Let's sit over a cup of tea and discuss those. Because before you even take me any further, what were those things? Men Boston saying, oh, I've read the Bible cover to cover. <laughs> but those are letters. Thank God for them. Those are letters to churches. They're simply letters to churches. Thank God for them. But how much did John need to deal with at the island of Patmos? To write a book like the book of Revelation. He calls it the book of Revelation. And it is historic. It is present. It speaks of the future. When you open the book of Revelation, wherever you are in life, it will speak to you. It is so eternal. Are you hearing me? But it looks like it carries no beginning and it carries no end. Because the beginning is God and the end is God. And even to begin that is so bottomless for the human mind to articulate or to even end that. How do we end that? How do we put a full stop to that? We can only agree, but we can't get to the end of these things communicated. But you see, one time I was in my you know, my personal communion with the Holy Spirit, with God. And I had this experience where the Christ was communing with me. And he starts to open my eyes to the things that many people have not been able to see. They just haven't had the opportunity to see. Things that when your eyes see them, you ask yourself, why is the Bible so closed to certain people? Why is the Bible so closed to certain people? Now, if this Bible is so closed, how then do you exercise yourself in matters beyond it? How do we even go into the things Christ, John wishes he could have written? Because in a figure he saw these things. Let us not forget that John saw these things. Now, I'll give an example. There are statements that sometimes we read and confess every time and then they become so part of our tongue to speak that it's almost as though, like I always tell people, the danger of familiarity. Okay? And because the devil works with familiarity. That's why he has formed what they call the familiar spirit. Familia. The thing that sort of will place a man in a deception that assumes it understands fully what it doesn't because you only need to put a little seed of pride in that man's spirit and that man will be deluded. If you are a reader, I want you to go and read of a spirit called Hubris, H-U-B-R-I. Hubris is a spirit that sits on men and gives them a false confidence in the misconception of what they think to understand but they actually don't understand. And you cannot make them understand because they have closed the windows of understanding. You get my point? And that is why sometimes, even when we talk about the exercises, you know, uh, meat is for those who have exercised themselves by reason of use to design that which is good and evil. Sometimes when we speak of spiritual exercises, eh, exercise yourselves unto godliness, sometimes when we define exercises, we must help men understand how to really exercise themselves in God. Because some things which appear to be exercises are phony 
They are deceptive. They are deceptive. Everybody in God, or even in the physical realm, there's a beginning stage for everybody, okay? And all of us begin as amateurs. Whether they're talking of football, whether they're talking of sports, whether they're talking of anything, every craft. You're not born up there. We all begin from an amateur stage, right? And in exercising ourselves into the spaces of the amateur, because we are exercising ourselves, okay? Don't forget that it is human nature to want to do things quickly, to get to the expert or professional mastery. It's just human nature. That is why for those of you who are midwives, you know, those of you who read and understand, that when a child is born immediately, okay, there's something they call the walking effect. When a child is born immediately, then you put your hand on their chest and then suspend them, they will walk. But that happens only for a few days. And after those few days, the human body tells him that even though you have limbs, there is a process that you need to build these limbs to walk. And a few days later, when you do the same act, they don't walk. Why? Because it is in human nature to want to move beyond its ability. You understand? It is human nature to want to assume itself in matters it's not exercised into. It's human nature to think that it knows what it does not know because the Bible says all the ways of a man seem rightful. Okay? It's just our nature, the carnal nature. Okay? But when you become spiritual, you start to realize that you don't rush things. You don't make haste in things. You learn to wait on God. You learn to exercise yourself. You respect the process more. You understand what I'm saying? Years ago, a young man came and told me, Apostle Grace, I want seven times your anointing. Lay hands on me. I looked at the guy, I loved him. And I laughed and told him, you will die. So I walked away. Because what is he asking for? Does he know what he's asking for? you understand what I'm saying? Does he even have a clue of what he's asking for? And do seven time anointings come that way? When Elisha received this double portion for walking with a man and pouring water on his hands for years, this one I've just met and it's... Seven times. Praise God. He would die because he doesn't have a clue of even what he's asking for. Somebody shout hallelujah. But when a man has hubris, okay, and I know you've been around a life where you can see an individual who gets to a point where they are sure they know what they actually don't know. And the problem with hubris is that you err at the point when you shine most. Or when you think you're shining. How many people say, I'm the best driver of the reason, and then they crash? Hubris. Hubris. I'm the best this, and then the moment they give them the opportunity to prove that they are the best, they crash. They crash. They crash. Because hubris is a false confidence. It looks like the confidence you have in Christ. But it is not established in the judgments of God because nobody has weighed it and it has not been proved by the patterns of the Spirit. And all these must be proved. So the Bible says. So sometimes people have this confidence. And that's where familiarity, the familiar spirit works with. Because I know this stuff. And that's that one I know. Yeah, yeah that one I know. Okay, if you know it, then why isn't it working in your life? Oh, no, that one I know. Okay, so then why isn't it working in your life? Because you first finish a class, excel in the exercise of it, then we say you know what you're saying. Somebody shout hallelujah. And because of that, many have turned professional but don't mastery. Many are experts but not in the spaces of mastery because they don't understand deep exercises, to deeply exercise yourself, to go deeper beyond the overconfidence of the self. 
you can't enter that space of you know deep exercise or deep confidence you can't enter that when you're still in the flesh because the flesh will puff you eh? he says appoint not a novice list out of pride he will fall in the snares of the devil why is there even a possibility of appointing a novice because sometimes we look at what men are able to do and we apply them to their abilities and not maturity in the ability and now we have problems because many people are standing in spaces where they have not the grace to contain. It becomes too much for them. And truly, we have exercised them in matters beyond them. Why? Because some of us don't understand the difference between maturity and gift and talent. And yet, I have seen men without the gifting and talent do better than men with the gift and with the talent. Because this thing called to exercise is a very powerful thing. And now even psychologists are proving by all nature that sometimes talent and gifts are overrated because now they're discovering that indeed the race is not to the swift. <laughs> Which the Bible said so many years ago. But many people don't understand it. You think that one is a worshiper because they have a nice voice. You understand what I'm saying? And then God gets men with plain voices. He even gets men without voices. And they sing better than men who had voices. Some of the songs we sing, you don't even know the men who wrote them. You never had their voices. But the voices of their worship went beyond the voices of men which sing them. They sang beyond men with the best voices could ever sing because they were exercised into mastery. That is why in the world they have something called naive meritocracy. Because the world used to reward merit. If you work hard, you do this, you do this, and then, yeah, with this it means you shall be successful. Now they are finding pockets of people who by merit were not successful, but in the world are very successful. You find school dropouts, and they are the ones building the biggest programs in IT, and you're like, but what about the guy who went through school and studied the whole degree? I'm not saying I'm against degrees. I'm not saying I'm against your diploma, master's degree or your PhD. I'm only saying until you enter the space of mastery, you'll never find your path. But there's not only one way into mastery. There's not only one way into mastery. As you grow in God, you start to realize that there are other ways into mastery. You just know the one way. And those are things only men which have excelled beyond mastery understand. Because when you go beyond mastery, you learn enough to teach other ways. Who has understood what I just said? It's like math equations. When we were growing up, our teachers used to provoke us to find equations in math. And there are other ways that we could learn to the answer. We quite could not explain the answer. But we could learn to the answer without the equation the teacher gave us. And the problem with some education, when a child goes to the answer without the process that the teacher gave them, they would mark them wrong. Why? Because they want you to get to the answer only by the equation they gave you. If education understood better, educari, to go within and mold without, it means just appreciate that this fellow went to the same answer you did, but they have not used the same equation that you used. It means that somewhere in there, there is something shining out of this individual that quite finds answers, not the way your conventional equation gives. But the problem with many education systems, then we kill those ones and force them to only give answers according to the equations that the world gives. And over the years, they start to look like the men who gave equations. Predictable. Somebody shout hallelujah. And that is why I think in a way education, not in a bad way, but in a way, I know all of you understand, education can limit sometimes when we don't make people have the full understanding of why the mind is supposed to be educated. So I'm not saying don't go to school. If you drop out of school, 
It's your own spirit, not the spirit of Fanero Ministries International. Pun intended. Somebody shout hallelujah. And so, I have seen people who are so confident in what they think they know, and they don't. Who breathes? Who breathes? Who breathes? Who breathes? Who breathes? And if we deal with that in church, you will realize that pride will leave some people. We'll become more humble. Because who breathes? He's around proud men, okay? The novice is proud. He says, appoint not a novice, list out of pride. Okay? List out of pride. Because when you're young, there's a certain pride that comes when you are at the level of acceptable performance. Okay? How many people think they can drive a car because they can move it from here to Kampala? Many. Please sit down with a person and ask them, what is defensive driving? Huh? What is defensive driving? I don't know, but do you know how to drive? Yes, I can drive. What is the meaning of that sign? Huh. I don't know. But your driver, yeah, you even have a permit. Mm -hmm. Because in some countries, you can even have a permit without having stepped behind a wheel. Yeah? I have shared this with parents. You look at your kids when they are growing. There's a point a boy child will tell you, can I drive? There's something in him that tells him, eh? you just engage the gear because it is engage the gear. And then you just press. You understand what I'm saying? Somebody shout amen. Shout glory to God. Shout glory to God. And so our concern and the thing that I feel provoked in my spirit to share with you is how do we elevate ourselves into these graces? How do we increase in the things of the spirit and how do we enter superior realms how do you live where you are how do you you know again i tell people if you come into the presence of god is not pushing you to become better then why are you coming why do you come why do you withstand all the rain and the you know the blistering you know heat and the smoldering cold and all these experiences some of you you're going back to be abused for being in service today you understand what I'm saying? But why are you here? Because God is trying to grow something in your spirit. He's trying to grow something in your spirit. Now, the Lord told me as ago, I was reading a wonderful scripture, in Exodus 35 verses 8. He says, and the oil, okay, for the light, he says, and the spices for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense. And Jesus told me something so powerful that I'd never thought about. He said, as it was of old that particular spices made certain anointings. Okay? When you study the different anointings that function on different individuals, they are spices that are engaged in the art of this apothecary or the art of creating, of making in two forms that form the anointing people carry. So all of us, the anointing functioning on our lives is defined by the spices that were used in the building on the anointing. I'm not talking about the anointing all of us have as believers. I'm talking about the anointing that makes you distinctive. Somebody shout hallelujah. I'm talking about that thing that says, okay, there are 30,000, but this one has a difference. You understand what I'm saying? The oil is in the spices. That's what it is. Okay? And like I said, what was on John? To see things that could not be written. And on an island of Patmos, he is writing things to come. And he's not a prophet. He says, and the Spirit shall show thee things to come. But when he's talking about things to come, is he talking about the person who's going to be with you in 2012? Yeah, at your level. But what is Uganda going to look like in 2050? What is the world going to look like in 2017? What is your individual path in the world at that time? Paul says, I have not seen ear has not heard. He says it has not entered the hearts of men 
that which the Lord has what? Prepared for them that love him. But the next line says, and he has revealed it to us by his spirit. Yeah. The spirit that searches out the bottomless things of God. Now, the reaction that I have in fellowship with this person of the Holy Spirit is not to get these things that are bottomless, but to understand the things that have been given me. In the realm of revelation, even before it is revealed to my mind, it is already in my spirit. Because the Bible says, He has revealed it. He has revealed it. That's why I always tell people, do you know what it means to carry what even you, your eye hasn't seen? What even you, your ear has not heard? And probably, even your heart has not fully comprehended it. But, to access it, you have to believe that you have it. And it's not just enough to believe that you have it, you need a certain eye in the matter. Because if your eye is deluded, if your vision is deluded, if your eye of the spirit is deceived, it means that every time you think in the spaces of the things not seen, or not heard, or have not entered into the hearts of men, you will still think in the realm of the things you probably had not seen with your own eye only without understanding that this is a total sum of things from the beginning of the world till now. Think about it. Sell up. Consider that God has put in you what eye has not seen, what ear has not heard, and what has not entered the hearts of men. Now if we are to show forth the praises of his glory who calls out us out of darkness into his marvelous light, it means the things that I show you, you have never seen before. If we are to teach things, it means the things that we teach you will never have had before. Not at least the way they have been given. And the things that have been planted in your heart, you have not received of that planting before. It is possible for God to release something on your life that the world has never had. Somebody needs to receive it. Somebody needs to receive it. It is possible for God to bring an idea in your spirit no man has ever had. It is possible for God to interpret a dream out of you that no man has ever interpreted. To give a concept in your spirit that no man has ever conceptualized. To give an innovation in your soul that no man has ever innovated. Your eyes to see things that only you are able to see. That when you get to the place of appearing before the world, this physical realm, you're bringing something to the table. When a man understands these things, you leave a mark on earth. You don't die an ordinary woman. You don't die an ordinary man. Listen. This is the thing that elevates the graces. This is the thing that takes us into superior ranks. When our eyes can truly get the full apprehension of what they have seen in God but carry not the articulation of fully, yet they have seen it. Then when God gives us the language, when he gives us the speech of those things, mark me right, speech and language are two different things. And the power of possibility is around the reconciliation of language and speech. These people being of one language and one speech, nothing that they think shall be withheld from them, shall be constrained from them, shall be impossible with them. The spirit of possibility is around the language reconciling with the speech because when your language reconciles with your speech it means that you have the full circle, the full picture of what God has placed in the ease out of you and the ability for the manifestation of the same. How many people feel things they will never say? How many people are feeling things that will never come out of them? They try to express it, but nothing in the world is fully expressing it. They try to say it, but there's nothing in the world they will really ever say to fully. Yet there's something. You feel it. You, you feel it. You feel it. You feel it. But just the grace to bring it out in the language that must be understood. Because without spiritual language, how do we communicate? And many of us are not able to talk in the spirit. It doesn't mean we don't pray. No. 
some people really pray. I know people who spend days and nights and years praying, but they never see the things they're supposed to see. Because even in the place of prayer, there are prayers without sight. They are prayers without understanding. I've seen people who pray and they die praying. I found a man somewhere in a certain nation. He's been praying for the past 40 years. But when you look at him, it's almost as though every day something is leaving him. Even in his life of prayer. Some of you should understand what it means to experience God. To see him as he is. To know God as he is. To walk the life of liberty in God like you should. Because the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of God is, there is liberty. We're not talking about just the liberty that brings back your lost child. No. We're talking about the liberty that just gives you understanding of how much is available for you. And just to see how much is available for you. You don't even pray for your child to come back. Your child comes back. Because there are visions when they set on your life, you'll never ask for certain things. Again. You'll never pray for certain things. Again. You'll never pray a certain way. Again. Because there are certain things that when they settle on your life. Oh! Sometimes I wish we could get men into this fellowship. To see, to understand for themselves the beauty of this, they are the full experience of this when men understand this. Your lives will change. Let me say this. Years ago, I had an encounter with Jesus. You remember where Isaiah was, where he says, who shall we send? Some people don't know. <laughs> but that's a place in the spirit, to be a part of such a conversation. Some people don't understand that Isaiah was invited to that conversation. They think that he phoned it. There are things even in scripture that are called unsearchable. They're not in the realm of things you can say that I'm going to go uh, for him or I'm going to go in the head is for him. No, it's nicey. It's in your mouth. Are you hearing me? Now, Isaiah, he goes and he hears, whom shall we send? And Isaiah says, Send me, Lord. A destiny was birthed. An assignment was given. And that assignment was not meant for Isaiah. It was for the man who could come to that conversation. Years ago, I entered a conversation. And in that conversation, I don't even think I'm supposed to be there in my head. But I remember very well that Christ started a conversation and I found a conversation there with certain men, certain individuals. And some of these men, I can testify today, they are big men of God. I have met them before in the spirit, but I have seen that since that experience, these men that I saw, the Lord has distinctively used in the church of Jesus Christ. I was so blessed to attend that meeting. It was like a meeting. It was like a sort of a place and I just found myself invited there and the Christ was speaking things. He, he was expressing certain concerns because when you read Ezekiel and understand why a man always says the angel of the Lord And then he took me this way. And then he communed with me this way. Some people think that those are just prose and poetry, just exchanged to make grammar look good. No. But these, honestly, are experiences men saw. These are things men had access to. These, Isaiah, Jeremiah, these are things actually God spoke and they heard. That's what makes them prophets. Because he didn't only speak to them, but he spoke by them. Do you understand what I'm saying? In Zechariah chapter 1 and verses 19, we see four horns. The man of the spirit is driven into 
a vision where he sees four horns. And these are the four, he calls them the four powers um, that divided Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And if you're a reader of the word, if you follow the order of the division of Judah into the division of Israel and the division finally of Jerusalem, a lot will open up for you why the church is the way it is. Because indeed they are four powers. Okay? And in prayer the Lord started to show me these powers, right? He speaks of, and I said unto the angel that talked with me, what be these? And he says, and he said, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel and Jerusalem. If you read the Amplified, he calls them the powers that have scattered Judah and Israel and Jerusalem. These are the powers that have actually attacked the church. He said, what come of these? And he spoke saying, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head. Okay? These are the attacks on the body of Christ. Okay? So that no man did lift up their head. How many of you know that the lifting of head is vision? Okay? Lift up your eyes and see. For the fields are what? Are white. When God told Abraham to lift up his eyes, he inherited the world. Are you hearing me? The place of the lifting up of men's heads is to see the things they must see see and enter and function in the purposes they must function and since time in memorial these are the four these are the four powers ask god what are they and in reading i started to see by the spirit the lord started to lead me into these things it was like a conversation but again this was a conversation that sort of was like tapped into it was a place for available men like i said there are things god has called you to do are you hearing me? But there are things God will invite you to make the choice to do. Those ones are not based on what he called you to do. Those ones are based on how available and yielded you are to him to do. That's why I say, those ranks are not for men who pray so much, who fast so much. But those ranks are for men who are available to God when he needs them. He says, for I sought for a man, any man that could stand in the gap and I found none. But if any man was available when the invitation was made, oh, that is the kairos, when time meets opportunity. Now, you see that the four powers are, the first is Babylon. Right? When you understand the mystery of Babylon, you understand what is attacking the church. The second one is Media Persia. Oh yeah, it's Media. But what is Media? Really? The Latin word is Medium. But let's go to the Greek. Let's go explore why it's Media. What did the spirit of Persia do to Daniel? When he prayed. Did God answer? Yes. 21 days a man is delayed from revelation. And when the angel comes, we realize that what is delayed is actually revelation. And we see for the first time that Satan can delay the message you need to take your ministry to the next level. The third is Greece. And the fourth is Rome. And you realize these in scripture are the universal empires. And they all have their systems and play. Verses 20, when the Lord showed the four horns, he gets this man and says, come, I want to also show you something. He takes him to four carpenters. Are you hearing me? Meaning that for every problem, you should never worry. By the way, you should never worry about any problem in the body of Christ. God raises men for every problem. And he mixes the apothecary of spices to anoint the man specifically for the problem in the body. You should never worry that the church of Jesus Christ can never sink. That one can never sink. The ones that are sinking are churches of men. But the one he built, he says, I shall build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. That one will never die. It will always have men which are available to fix the powers. In verses 21 he says, and it's back saying that these are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head. But these are come, the carpenters, to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter them. He's saying, I got four men to fix four issues. 
Meaning that for any challenge in the body of Christ, there must be an available man. For any problem in the world, any challenge in the world, there must be an... Oh, you didn't understand. HIV is incurable. Avail yourself. You'll be the first doctor to heal HIV. Did you understand what I just said? There's poverty in Africa. Oh, you know why? Because when you pray, you're asking God to help you get a job. And then when you get the job, you look after your house. And then after your house and your children. Oh, what will my children eat? Oh, God is looking for a woman to say, God, Africa needs aid. Europe needs aid. Asia needs aid. The economies of this world need to change. And I think I'm available. God is looking for available people whose heads are lifted up enough to see the bigger picture and place a demand on the oil that heaven will start mixing the spices. They are particularly necessary to appoint you in the place that is needed. And he says, with that one, it is for available And when the anointing is mixed well and it settles, you realize you can only minister by unction. That is the power of unction. Because the power of unction comes in knowledge of. Not in the emotional. He says we have an unction from on high. He says we know all things. That kind of unction, when it stands on the altar, it knows what to teach. When it starts to worship, it knows where to touch. When it does business, it knows how to deal. When it ministers, it knows how to minister. When it prays, it knows which dimension and degree to pray. When it yields, it knows at what degree it needs to yield. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Men and women of God. Pray for these things. Hunger for these things. Apply yourself for these things. You will be amazed at the mark you leave on us. Refuse to die an ordinary person. The anointing of the Spirit is here. Just raise your voice and speak to God. God is here. God is here. Some of you will understand that our ministry is liberty. Our businesses are liberty. Our families are liberty. Everything the Lord has given to you to do, it has to be done in the freedom and liberty of the Spirit. Because God knows that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I see God put anointings on some of you like you have never seen, never dreamed, could not have even asked for because you did not know what you needed. But now you know. Speak to God. Speak to God. Speak to God. Let every man ask for his part. In the account of things that you feel God invites you to. I feel God is inviting me to something so deep, so great. Oh! 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 Oh, 
Somebody receive this thing, I feel it. I feel it. Just receive it. There's spices of special oils flowing in the air. I feel by the Spirit of God, His grace is available to anoint certain people for deeper responsibilities. Your ranks are shifting. The graces are elevating. The favor is there in the mighty name of Jesus. Things are shifting for you. Your voice is separated from the noises. You call me Pray You guide me hey. oh. When they think they know you They will realize they never knew you Why? Because God on you is eternal He's bottomless and he's willing to reveal himself through you differently and deeper every other day. Place a demand on this because it is given to you. Place a demand to function on this because it is yours. Receive it. Simply receive it. It is given. Receive it. God says that the sufficiency is not of us as of to speak of anything by us, but the sufficiency of God, which has made us ever ministers of a covenant. Pray prayer that takes it all.
give it all. Somebody give him a mighty hand of praise. We receive it all. We receive it all. We receive it all. We receive it all. We receive it all, God. We don't leave anything behind. We take it all that you've prepared for us tonight. And our lives cannot be the same again. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You're sick in your body. Receive your healing now. Healing is the children's bread. It's not higher than any man. Be healed. In the mighty name of Jesus. I pray for your finances. May God fix them. For those that are believing for jobs, may God give them. May God settle you. Those that seek for children, may God give you children. Those that are hungry for ministry, may God advance your ministry. In Jesus' name, say amen. Now if you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, you say tonight, I feel I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want you to repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I've heard your word and I believe it. I believe that you died and rose again for me. Today, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at sonerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.sonero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.